Hello, uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, session on uh, piercing the veil of secrecy, cracking the impossible, North Korea and the Vatican. Um, I'm delighted to be sharing the stage today with uh, two of America's most celebrated investigative journalists, um, each of whom has found uh, a very different way of opening up a secretive or uh, opaque state. In Suki Kim's case, um, the state in question is North Korea. Her best-selling book, uh, Without You, There Is No Us, was the result of an epic undercover investigation in which she um, spent uh, many months living undercover as an English teacher in a university run by Christian evangelists in the North Korean capital. Um, uh, for the best part of a year, Suki was uh, spied on in practically every waking moment uh, and had her conversations and emails bugged by the regime, but she still managed to return to the US and get a very powerful story um, out into the wider world. Michael Resendiz, uh, meanwhile, has exposed some of the darkest secrets in a very different secretive state, uh, the Vatican. In 2001, Michael, who is a, a member of the Boston Globe's famous Spotlight investigations team, began to look into the sexual abuse of uh, children by Catholic, Catholic priests in the city, uh, which was being covered up by the church. A couple of years later, Mike's work had led to the resignations of, uh, I, I think, around 150 priests in the Boston area, uh, including the Cardinal Law, who was the head of the Catholic Church in the city. Um, he now has a Pulitzer Prize, uh, and his character is the star of an Oscar-winning Hollywood movie about the case, um, in which Mike is played by the world's most handsome man, Mark Ruffalo. <laughs> Our panel, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So I was going to start uh, this discussion, really, um, about these two very different stories, but uh, which in some ways have some very similar traits, by asking each of you to, to perhaps give an overview of um, how you decided that this was the story that you were going to put such an immense amount of uh, effort into. And maybe, Suki, you could start. What, why did you decide to investigate North Korea and, and launch on this incredibly difficult uh, investigation? Well, when I began the journey, I didn't know that it was going to take so long. And I didn't <laughs> know what the journey really was. You know, I went there, uh, 2002, North Korea is uh, uh, something that, you know, the world is fascinated by now. But growing up, it was just a, a story. It was always about the sorrow and heartbreak of the Korean people. So coming from families, um, my grandmother, her son was uh, taken to North uh, Korea when he was 17 during the war. And she just waited her life, uh, waiting for him to come home, you know, because he just, she just thought he'll just walk in the door because of course the Korea was a one country, you know, it was a, it was a temporary measure to create this wall between North Korea and South Korea. So knowing that story, I think that um, I always did think about this idea of uh, living your whole life uh, waiting and also with this heartbreak mm -hmm. and also just dying of heartbreak and what that means for an entire generation mm -hmm. to feel such sorrow and are you ever going to be okay as a nation? And that's more a bigger question I think I was really obsessed with. Mm -hmm. How do you recover from that kind of sorrow when the entire nation suffers from that? Mm -hmm. And what is the amnesia where you can move on to the next generation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, pretending that everything's fine. Um, so anyway, I, f I think I describe Korea as a diseased nation in my book. Um, but in 2002, when I went into North Korea, what immediately struck more was the uh, utter uh, devastation, because in the 90s, uh, a tenth of the population died of famine. So we're talking like two to three million people's death that happened. So when I went in in 2002, soon after the famine, uh, it was so utterly, uh, there was just nothing there. <laughs> you know, the electricity or people were just 
the, the starvation you could really feel, but also absolute control. I think that's mm -hmm. when it began mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what does it mean that you can't go anywhere? What, when a minder meets you at an airport and you can only go where they decide to go and this, this whole obsession with a great leader, why is this a world like this exists and the rest of mm -hmm. the world is not pretending just mm -hmm. to look elsewhere? We're lo all looking elsewhere while the suffering is going on for mm -hmm. 70 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, so my obsession began and I kept trying to find a way in. I kept finding a way in, in under different guises and more and more I think I was just far too deep in it. It became unacceptable in my mind to ignore this. And as a writer, what can I do? I mean, I think this is a big question. As a writer, what can we do except uh, investigate it and deliver the truth out of there? And it was, it was very much your own mission, this one. It, you didn't have a kind of desk. You didn't have a, a kind of editorial team behind you or a, a kind of foreign editor making sure that you were going to be safe on this trip. You, you decided individually, yourself, that this was something that you were going to do. I, if I had been like a part of a news team, first of all, I wouldn't have been let in. But also, I didn't, you know, because it, it was just, like it, it was not just an article. Like it was going to be a book and deliver this world. So delivering a world, you can't just go uh, look at one thing. You have to look at everything. You know why? I had to interview defectors, like over a hundred of them. But not only like in one location. I interviewed them like in the Chinese border. I interviewed them in Mongolia. Laos, Thailand, South Korea. I interviewed them when they just crossed the river. I interviewed them a year after they escaped and they're settled in South Korea. If, if also defectors' accounts cannot be verified, then it's really important to get their testimony at different stages because they keep changing their testimonies. And um, so I think the research was, it was almost like a, it, to me, it was, I mean, it was like getting like several PhDs or something. Like it was just a research to try to understand was my foremost. And I tried to actually not write short articles about it through that time, but just if it was gonna be a book, then getting to the heart of this and heart of something rotten, I think that's one thing that we also think we think every subject is kind of equal, but I don't think that's true. I think some subjects are just, if it's, if it's really rotten, it's just harder to get to the heart of it because it's all buried and you have to you know, get, shed the layers, right? To get to, if it's covered in lots of lies, you're gonna have to figure out how many of these things are lies and how many of these things are there so that I cannot get to the heart of it. And North Korea was a perfect example of that. Yeah, yeah. Mike, what about you? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So for me, the story of why I started uh, investigating the Catholic Church is, is in, in some ways a little more simple. In my case, the boss asked me to, and I said, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> you know, Marty Barron came to the Globe, and on his uh, first day of work, he got the idea that uh, we might want to take a look at one serial uh, accused priest, a priest who was accused of being a pedophile for more than 30 years. Uh, but that said... Um, uh, I uh, was very eager to tackle this subject. Uh, you know, there are a lot of similarities. Uh, that's why we're having this presentation between what Suki did and, and what I did. And, uh, one of the similarities is, you know, Su Suki is Korean and I was raised Catholic. And uh, there had been several scandals of priests who uh, sexually molested children before the Globe Spotlight team came along. So I was, I was pretty eager to take a look at this. I found uh, the things I had read about the previous scandals were disturbing. Uh, you know, what we did on the Spotlight team was not discover clergy sexual abuse, uh, not even close. What we did that was so different is we did penetrate uh, the heart of the evil uh, at the Vatican. We did penetrate uh, uh, the rot. And uh, specifically, what that means is we reported, we proved there was a cover-up uh, of sexual abuse by priests in the Catholic Church. You may have heard the adage that cover-up is worse than the crime. And, and that was the case with our reporting. Uh, we were the, were the first to be able to prove that there was a cover-up. And it turned out uh, that the cover-up uh, was taking place uh, all across the United States of America and all over the globe. Uh, in fact, this is a systemic practice uh, by uh, the Vatican to hide priests who have been accused of sexually abusing children by moving them from one parish to another. Uh, what can be more uh, insidious uh, and evil than allowing a man who presents himself as a representative God to sexually molest children? 
uh, it, as, as Suki said, it's, it's uh, rot, and the rot, are, the rot uh, is covered by lies. Uh, in the case of the Catholic Church, canon law requires all bishops to, and I'm quoting, protect the church from scandal. This is their first responsibility. So there's a structure uh, of cover-up, and there's a structure uh, of lies. And of course, uh, the Vatican is a nation state. It's its own country uh, and is accountable to no one. Uh, even in the United States, I think a lot of people know our US Constitution it, uh, protects reporters. We have a guarantee of a free press and free speech. What some people don't know is that same article of the United States Constitution protects freedom of religion. Uh, and it makes it even harder to penetrate the veil of secrecy when it comes to the Catholic Church because they enjoy a constitutional protection and they often hide behind it. Uh, often when the church is sued for whatever reason, but uh, in this case specifically uh, for covering up for priests who sexually molest children, the church will say, well, we have a First Amendment protection and therefore we're not required to turn over any documents or any, any of the evidence that would normally be turned over in a lawsuit. So those are some of the challenges uh, we had to face. But again, uh, you know, Suki and I both, the subjects on the surface could not seem more different. Uh, going undercover in North Korea and, and trying to uh, break uh, the secrets, the wall, of, break through the wall of secrecy around the Vatican. But in fact, you know, these are two institutions accountable to no one but, but themselves, hiding a tremendous uh, amount of personal devastation, and as Suki put it, uh, rot. Mike, do you, do you want to just give people a kind of flavor of how Spotlight works? I mean, for those who haven't seen the movie, um, uh, how, do you, how do you choose your stories? What, how do you select the team of reporters? Uh, and, and what kind of experience did you have before you chose this topic? Well, we, team reporting is, is a little bit different than uh, what most reporters are engaged in for a variety of reasons. The, the, the upside is, in the case of the Spotlight team, we had four reporters and one person who was a reporter slash editor, all working on the same subject, all working in the same room, uh, apart from uh, the newsroom, down in the musty, dirty uh, basement of the old Boston Globe. Uh, and the great advantage is you sort of have four minds that are acting as one. I mean, uh, it was very informal. You know, we didn't necessarily have to call a meeting, although occasionally did. We were always uh, in the same room, always coming in and out, having spontaneous uh, conversations, sharing uh, our discoveries, and uh, moving forward at a pretty rapid clip because we did have four people who were uh, all very highly skilled reporters working in concert. Now, in order for that to happen, uh, everybody has to get along. And I think uh, when, when it comes to team reporting, you're looking for uh, special individuals. You're looking for people who are very good reporters, but people who also are capable of swallowing their ego. Uh, and uh, you know, the kind of the, a person you don't want on, a, on an investigative team is the kind of person, in fact, you frequently find in a news organization, which is the prima donna. You know, the person that wants to get uh, their name on page one and, and uh, get all the credit for a story. That, that's the person you don't want uh, on a team. Uh, so we were fortunate. Uh, our editor, uh, Walter Robinson, I think he picked uh, a group of people with a balance of strengths and a balance of experience who are all capable of uh, uh, putting their ego aside in the interest of the greater good. And, and is it true that um, Marty Barron, who's this now the editor of the Washington Post and has a, acquired a sort of legendary status, he uh, certainly in the movie he's sitting in the uh, in an editorial meeting and he's reading a column by um, one of the Globe's uh, columnists and picks out a line and says, "I think this is interesting," and that's how the story starts. Uh, the movie is completely accurate. I mean, I think if it were not for Marty Barron, uh, the Globe Spotlight team would not have investigated clergy sexual abuse. <clears throat> in the Catholic Church. It's absolutely true that Marty Barron, uh, on his first day of work, he read a, an opinion column uh, by a Globe reporter who wrote that um, there had been a series of lawsuits filed by victims of one priest who uh, was a serial pedophile. And the lawyer who was representing these victims, not a very well-known guy, no one had ever heard of him before, except that he, he was sort of a fringe character in Boston's legal community. And uh, the woman who wrote the story, Eileen McNamara, she reported that the judge hearing the lawsuit had sealed all the records that had been turned over as evidence in this case. And she reported in her column, she said, she wrote these words, she said, because of the judge's actions, the truth may never be known. And to Marty Barron, I think that was just a, like a red flag. 
And Marty believes that it's the job of a journalist to discover the truth, in some cases, no matter what. And we can never tolerate a situation uh, where, because of an action taken by someone in a position of authority, the truth may never be known. Our job is to find the truth. Uh, so Marty uh, had the idea that perhaps we should challenge the judge's order. Perhaps we should go to court and file a motion to challenge the confidentiality order. And, eventually, and we did do that. Uh, Marty Barron also asked us to look into the story of this particular priest, uh, John Gagan, and that ended up being my assignment, uh, to go deep, so to speak, on John Gagan. And we did discover the uh, evidence of the cover-up of child sex abuse without winning our court motion. We got those records through a sort of complicated series of uh, maneuvers and a relationship that I struck with the attorney I mentioned earlier. But then we did win our motion to have these orders unsealed. And it set, up, it set a legal precedent, and because of that, eventually we got all the records in the Boston Archdiocese about priests who had sexually molested children. And in this case, you know, we started investigating one priest. We got to a point where we thought there might be six who were molesting children, and we thought that would be a pretty big story. But at the end of the day, when we published our story, we had credible uh, evidence that 70 priests in the Boston Archdiocese alone had been accused of sexually molesting children, and by the way, that number today is 250 priests credibly accused of molesting children just in the Boston Archdiocese uh, since 1950. I mean, I think one of the lessons of these two very different stories is that uh, it's possible to open these very secretive uh, states, organizations, but it requires an immense amount of journalistic effort. And in the case of the Globe, you had, you had a team of reporters working full-time on it for, for two years or, or, or whatever it was. Suki's case is very different. One reporter working 24-7, um, you, you, you decided to go undercover or you were given this kind of opportunity to go undercover. Just, just tell us about that and, what, and how you made that decision and what it was like. I think just listening to Mike, um, you know, that this whole team, and also in the movie, for those of you who haven't seen the film, I was very envious watching the process because you have all these really smart, dedicated people to brainstorm with and also ask, like, should, should I or should I not? And I think this was always my struggle. And also, because of... Um, once I also realized, like, this is going to take a long time and it's, I would have to live there. Uh, I remember one day telling my father, I had just got, gotten back where I was trying to get in the second or third time and failed. And um, I went there five times total, but I told my father, who was the only one I actually in the beginning was uh, talking about it with, and I said, you know, I'm just going to have to move to Pyongyang and live there. And he, he looked at me and thought, no, you're insane. <laughs> I mean, how is that going to happen? I mean, of course, a decade later, that is what happened. I did live in Pyongyang for six months. But I think always it was, um, I didn't know what to do. So I uh, was following many leads. There was at some point some sports commission I was going to maybe go in with, some medical, because uh, there's all, getting into North Korea, you go through some organization. Some people do it as a tourist. I never took that road because I don't believe in it. Um, I also, I just think that, you know, the money you spend as a tourist uh, is going to go to the regime. And also, I think tourism into the, like, you're going to go in there for three days and they take you to the three different great leader sites and you come back out. You know, I went to North Korea five times and I saw the exact uh, same subway station. <laughs> Uh, five times, and the Juche Tower, the famous uh, great leader tower, tw uh, five times. So that just, I, I don't see the point of doing that. So then you have to find a different organization. And there are so many, when there is actually like a rotten center, it just, everything else is seedy. So there's many sort of brokering kind of people who claim to be bringing you into North Korea with some dodgy organization. So I was following up these trails, and sometimes I just wasn't sure. But I also couldn't tell anybody, because clearly I realized I would have to go in there somehow uh, hiding my real purpose of writing the book. At some point I had a book contract already, but secrecy was a part of it. So I told uh, virtually no one that I was planning this except three people. Um, other than, I mean, even my family, only, only my dad knew. 
and my brother-in-law, but I didn't even tell my sister. Um, I, I didn't, the three people that I chose to tell it to or consult with were because I thought they could get me out. I mean, not get me out, nobody could get me out, but if I get stuck there, which was more likely than not, then they could maybe get the word out. So for that, I chose two journalists uh, of very um, big reputation in America and also in South Korea. And the third person uh, was related to the government. So I thought these three people can spread words. So when some questions arose, like this university I was pursuing, I ended up going in with them. It's an international organization. They were setting up an evangelical school. It seemed totally unlikely when I heard about it for the first time in 2008. I applied anyway. Initially, I applied to live there and teach in North Korea for two years. And I did that because I thought that would give me a bigger chance of getting accepted. But I also just didn't know each step. Like, are they also another thing about this kind of trying to do uh, being embedded or undercover is that you can't really ask a lot of questions because it raises suspicion. You know, they think, oh, why is she asking questions? So I had to just keep my mouth shut and just not a lot <laughs> and agree and people generally like that you know I mean men love that if you just sit there <laughs> yeah, <it's true. laughs> and say I agree and clap you know I mean this is how you deal as a as a woman it's a weakness uh, you know, it's not a weakness it's I think being underestimated as a woman can be your great strength because men just love to talk so uh, let them talk and you just sit so I did actually a lot of that so because I didn't really speak, they just assumed I was an evangelical. And everyone who had to interview me were uh, male in this field. And it's unbelievable. This evangelical organization was going in, and none of them ever questioned, are you uh, also an evangelical? They just assumed I was one, because they were one. So at no, at no point did you have to kind of pretend to be somebody that, that you weren't? I basically, so the way to, I just didn't, you know, say, for example, one of the reasons I think I was allowed in was the fact I had many identities. So I was a Fulbright scholar, specifically that year in 2008. And you, anybody can be a Fulbright scholar for any reasons, but I, had, uh, I was a research scholar working on my book, so I didn't have to tell them I was working on my book. I just said I was a research scholar. What that meant was I was associated with this very famous organization that was about education. So they misunderstood and thought I was an educator. Another thing was, um, so in 2008, I was covering the New York Philharmonic in Pyongyang uh, as a correspondent for Harper's Magazine. So I went in as a sort of a press junket. About 100 journalists went in. Because Harper's is a long-form narrative literary magazine, uh, I, instead of just going to that event, I followed the orchestra for about a week or longer. So I was just sort of hanging out with the orchestra. I was also talking to the funders of the concert, because if a Philharmonic goes into Pyongyang for this massive diplomatic moment, not that different from, in a way, what's happening with the Olympics right now with South Korea and North Korea, that's a big PR moment that they have that's gonna happen. So when that kind of stuff happens, there are a group of funders. So I had to go and interview them at an ambassador's house in Beijing. There was a big party. In that party, so this is a reporting part of it, one of those funders dropped the word that she said, oh, and then there's a, a, I'm also, you know, supporting, she was funding a new university that was being set up in Pyongyang, she said. It just was one sentence. And I thought, there's a university? And um, she said, sure. And that, that's where it all began. It had nothing to do with that story, but it was something she slipped. So I immediately applied for that university, and because I came with her introduction, who's one of the most famous wealthy person in the world, the organization also immediately took me on because they thought I was more important than I was <laughs> for their funding purpose. So I mean, sometimes there's all these things that allow an opportunity to happen. Now, people didn't quite understand how I made in. Also, it was, you know, my first no book was a novel. So the fact that actually, you know, people don't take novelists yeah. seriously sometimes. And I think that also helped. Like I was not a journalist in their eyes. I was just some girl who was writing some stories. And I think that was also why I was not a threat. Because if I had been deemed as a threat, I would have never been allowed in. So top tip for investigative journalists is pretend to be a novelist. <laughs> um, just just uh, 
tell us what the risks were in this trip because I mean potentially if you'd been caught by the regime you could have been sent to a, a gulag and, and never heard from again right well I mean that what the consequences were was very uh, you know I cannot it would still be all a guess right we cannot tell exactly what will happen but it's a place where you know, depending on the political crisis of the moment, they usually take a hostage. So what Otto Warmbier, all he had to do is take the poster down, and then he was, I believe it was a 16-year gulag sentence. Of course, he came out as a corpse. Uh, the hostages that get taken, not hostages, it's more people who get stuck there. Uh, it's usually because uh, they are doing something they said, you know, if you walked in as whatever, humanitarian organization, then it's gonna be fine, because you're doing what you t said you were gonna do. It's just in my case, I was doing something that I, I like walked in pretending to be a, a university school teacher, and that's not what I was doing. So if I were caught, it would have been espionage, and that's definitely, I mean, execution was what was on my mind. I just thought maybe diplomatically they might, I mean, so I had to go through those in you know, a chances in my mind, and I thought maybe they won't do it, <laughs> then it'll be lifetime, right? Good luck sentence, and who will come and get me out is more what I was yeah. worried about. Yeah. Um, Mike, the risks for the globe w weren't insignificant either. I mean, it, uh, Boston is a hugely Catholic town. It was, it was a risky story to run there. What, what sort of pushback did you, did you get from the Catholic Church, and how difficult was it to deal with? Well, first of all, uh, I never perceived any physical risk uh, the way that Suki did. And uh, I really admire Suki's courage uh, for going undercover in North Korea. That's a, that's a big deal. Uh, the risks to the globe uh, were also very real, but they were institutional. Uh, the situation in uh, Boston at the time and in Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts, the Catholic Church was the most powerful institution in the city of Boston. Uh, and Boston was the most Catholic city in the United States of America. And Cardinal Law, the Archbishop, was not just the Archbishop of Boston, he was the senior Catholic official in the United States. So you have a situation where we're dealing with an institution that's very, very uh, politically powerful. Uh, goes without saying, I suppose, that most of the Globe subscribers were also Catholic. So I think the concern in the publisher's office is that there might be a church uh, organized subscriber boycott that would hurt the globe uh, economically in a very serious way. And uh, it's to the great credit of the globe uh, publisher at the time and to the uh, New York Times Company, which owned the globe, uh, to, that they made the decision uh, to go ahead uh, and investigate this story. Uh, there was a point where I was able to get a hold of uh, the records that proved there was a cover-up uh, that proved uh, Cardinal Law knew that one of his priests had spent 30 years molesting more than 150 children uh, in six different parishes and nevertheless allowed him to keep working as a priest. Once uh, I got those records, we sort of fanned out across the city and started doing interviews about them. And when the church found out we had those records, uh, they threatened to sue us. They wrote a threatening letter to the Globe saying that if uh, we used the documents in any way, talked about the documents to anyone at any time, then we would be faced with a lawsuit. Uh, honestly, I don't think we took that very seriously. I didn't take it very seriously, uh, but I wasn't going to have to pay uh, a, a judgment if the Globe uh, were ever found to have violated uh, a judge's order. But I think at that point, the information was so powerful, and I was, I was convinced that I had obtained the documents legally, uh, that we just did not take the threat of a lawsuit uh, very seriously. However, uh, the possibility of this story doing great economic damage to the paper was very real. Uh, it didn't turn out that way uh, because I think the reporting was uh, bulletproof. I mean, what we reported was based on the church's own internal records and therefore uh, no one could say our reporting was inaccurate. In fact, um, one of the things we did with this story, this was 2002, uh, there was no social media, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter. Uh, but the internet was already becoming a very powerful uh, vehicle for transmitting information. 
uh, there were search engines. There was Netscape was the big search engine. People were sending email with uh, AOL.com. So anyway, we, we, post, we not only posted our stories, we posted the church documents that the stories were based on. So when someone read the story, uh, they could go to the Globe's website and read the documents for themselves. So the story was absolutely bulletproof. Uh, it was absolutely clear that every sentence that we wrote was completely horrifyingly accurate. And for that reason, uh, there was no protesters in front of the Globe, and there were no economic sanctions because they would have been, in fact, uh, pointless. I read that um, the Globe had published, I think, eight, 800 stories on this uh, Catholic abuse in, in the, in the two-year period, more or less. Yes, I think that's about right. Which is... Um, it's quite a good editor's technique, isn't it, to keep a story going. You, you keep dripping things through all the time, and, and it flushes more and more information out. I mean, that was a presumably a conscious technique by... Well, Marty it wasn't Bar not entirely conscious. I mean, I think we were trying to do a little bit uh, what Suki was discussing. When you investigate a subject, sometimes you want to try to get all of it and put it out in a big package. In our case, it was not a book. It was a four-part series, and we ran these four very explosive stories in January. Uh, but what happened was uh, the story exploded, and in, a, and in a way, the church exploded, and it turned out that the story was even bigger than what we had discovered. And as we, uh, at that point, we, you don't see this in the movie, because the movie ends on the morning of the publication of the first story, uh, but we, the story got so big, we added four of the best reporters uh, at the Globe to our team, so we, we had a team of eight uh, working full-time, and uh, there was never a plan to just dribble things out. It's just that we kept making one discovery after another, discovery after discovery. And because of the legal precedent we set with our court motion, we eventually got all the records of uh, sexual abuse complaints against priests in the Boston Archdiocese. So uh, we were just writing one explosive story after another. Suki, I, I'm fascinated by uh, the little details as, as a kind of ex-journalist in your book about how you collected the information. So you had these three USB sticks. You had, um, you, you presumably, you were writing notes as soon as you got back from your interactions with these students of the elite who you were teaching. But you had to be completely secretive about the whole thing. I mean, just, just tell us how, how you could operate in that environment and, and what the psychological stress was like. It's interesting because I remember trying to figure this out before going in, and I asked a friend who is a journalist, uh, really heavy-duty investigative journalist in South Korea, and because I really looked up to him, um, thinking he knows what he's doing. And he said, look, what you're trying to do, because he was a part of a big, um, uh, like a sort of CNN of Korea. He was a, so he's, he said, look, look, I would never do this, and I don't even know how you do that. <laughs> He's like, as a traditional journalist, we don't do this kind of, um, I don't know how you can bring information out of North Korea. So I literally just had to, f I remember just thinking the only thing I have to do is just get the smallest, smallest um, USB sticks that looks really pretty. So that looks like it could be just, but I didn't want to go overboard because I knew there was a shop in New York where you could go and find USB sticks that look like maybe a jewelry pendant. But I thought if I went that far, then it would be when I'm caught, it really looks like spying. You know, I went there with an intention of hiding. So it was really like I was just relying on my own. I mean, at this point, I've been following this, thinking about it for a decade. So I knew that I had to rely on my instinct. So I did get like a purple, like it was a little like a sparkling silver USB sticks that were this little. So it looked like a pendant on my neck, but it wasn't just a blatant uh, espionage item. Uh, I remember going in when uh, one friend, uh, he knew I was going in, but he didn't know I was going to do what I was going to do because I'd never really consulted with him. And he said, oh, I know you're going to North Korea, but um, you know, can I give you a secret camera for you to film some of it for his project? I mean, this is why I, mean, I couldn't, this is why I wouldn't talk about it. And I was like, wow. I mean, that friendship didn't last, obviously. But I knew that I, I was like, no, I'm not taping anything. I, I took pictures, but all the pictures I took there were allowed because I knew that 
putting this on camera was more just obviously like, so in my own way, I was trying to be protective, like how to avoid execution, right? Like I so that it looks like an accident rather than, um, so I, so I mean, I, all that stuff, like really, like I did create a document within a document so that it looks like a school lesson, but then it's really a, a book, uh, all my reporting notes. And that was just because I just, you know, would they go through every page? Like, so I was being like just me thinking how to figure this out. And I remember one time we went to, um, so they take you, I was in this locked compound where they were watching me 24 seven with a minder sleeping below me. Uh, so in this really, really, you know, system of surveillance where I was watched 24 seven, uh, they took us out to these outings. You know, I was never allowed out except like once a week in a van uh, with a minder and we go on a trip and it doesn't matter what you see in North Korea because it's all about the great leader anyway. So, um, you know, you have to just listen to like a couple of hours of lectures about the great leader, how he stood, he stood right there and he sat right here. And <laughs> I mean, because when you think about it, like how can you tell a story of the same person over and over and over and over again, right? Like, so it's very detailed. I used to think it was, sometimes I would pretend it was like a radio drama. Because I, I would be like, wow, they have now just gone on for an hour about the great leader and the way he stood and like picked an apple. So we were taken to this, um, this mountain, it's very famous, Myohyangsan, very, very famous mountain. But of course, we spent very little time on the mountain itself, which was all great leader slogans. But there was a, a what they call like friendship museum. So friendship museum, there was like great leader side and the little great leader side, you know, Kim Il Sung museum, and there was a Kim Jong Il museum. And if you go in, it's all presents that were sent to the great leader um, from the world because the world worships the great leader. And there's all these like flashing numbers of like avenues named after Kim Jong Il. So they think like, so there's all this stuff like, you know, 79, uh, you know, streets named after Kim Il Sung. And you would see this little, just random stuff filled with gifts for the great leader. And I remember thinking, but how do I get this in a book? Because I know I can look up this information, but I cannot verify it. I'm, I bet it's incorrect, exact things that I'm seeing. So I have to think really fast. I cannot really take this down right now. So I said to the minder, you know, because I had a, uh, that, that semester I had a TA, and she was the only one I trusted among. Because also, remember, I was posing as an evangelical, so I, they didn't know what I was up to, the evangelicals. But there was one uh, young girl, TA, from New Jersey, uh, and she was an evangelical, but she was actually kind of considering studying North Korea philosophy a little bit, but not quite. She was more like an activist. So I immediately said, you know, uh, Katie is thinking of, to the mind, I said, Katie is thinking of getting a PhD in uh, Kim, Jong, Kim Il Sung studies. So it would be really, um, you know, just, we're just really curious what's here. So we just took down the note. So I was kind of using her position as sort of almost like an assistant to take down all the notes, because this was right now, reporting was needed. So in my book, there's like pages of detailed items of what was in that museum, how many numbers and all the stuff, but I was able to take that notes down. So there were things like that where you have to think really fast, how to take these notes down without raising suspicion. And, the, and the, the, the dialogue that you have with the students, presumably you race back to your room in a quiet moment and then tap that into the laptop and put it on the USB. Is that, is that how you work? Yeah, I mean, I would like try to remember everything they said. I always carried my laptop with me 24 seven. So, I mean, so being, I hate to say, you know, being undercover, you are sincere every moment, but you have to also be a little bit melodramatic. So, um, which is a hard mix to really keep your mouth shut and at the same time be melodramatic. But when I say melodramatic, like the, what, why am I carrying my laptop with me within the campus 24 seven? It doesn't really make sense. So I would just make a real show of being such a dedicated teacher. Like I would just tell the minders like, oh, I didn't sleep well because I'm thinking about the students, you know, whatever paper they have to write the next day school lesson. And then I would constantly sort of pull up my laptop and be like, oh, I have to fix that exam score. And um, that was so that I can write it down like all the time. So I had my laptop 
basically open wherever I went. Other things, I did have a little notebook, but I ripped it up. So if I have to write it down, if I don't have the time to pull this up, because we need quotes, what they just said. So I would write that down, and I always ripped it up. And what do you think the closest you came to being discovered was? Um, there was a moment, you know, so the double fear was because I was uh, living amongst about 30 hardcore evangelical Christians. And they were, uh, in, in, the organization was collaborating with the regime. So the deal they made with the North Korea was that they'll go in there, pour money in there, and who knows how much more money was being probably handed over to North Korea. That one, you know, probably requires more investigation. But so if they're pretending not to be Christians, I'm pretending to be them, pretending not to be Christian. I'm pretending to be Christian who's pretending to be not Christian. And so this was really hard because North Korean government ha is not, you know, religion's not allowed and it's an executionable crime to be proselytizing. So the organization made a deal to not, like, outside of the dorm that we lived in, they couldn't ever uh, show the sign of Christianity. But within the dormitory, there was a room where they could practice, which was allowed by the government, which was so they could do a secret Bible study mass. And, you know, I've never read a Bible in my life. So me pretending to be a hardcore Christian, having to go to the secret Bible studies, <laughs> Um, was impossibly difficult. And that's when it actually came close to, because I was uh, afraid if they knew what I was up to, the evangelicals, you know, I thought about that. Would they report me to the North Korean government? That was a possibility. Or they would kick me out instantly. But that was also not a good scenario either. And one of them did um, bring it up with me. She said, I just don't think... So what they do was um, one of the things... They ate bread, saying that was uh, Jesus' flesh. What is it called? I don't even know what that really is. Christ, yeah, it's body called uh, transubstantiation for all the Catholics in the audience. Trust the Catholic. <laughs> right, this stuff, which I, <laughs> I was supposed to know very well. And the blood, they drank wine and in, the, in the little room, right? Yes, so the uh, ritual <laughs> is to convert uh, bread to the body of Christ and, blood, and uh, wine to the blood of Christ. And it's called, uh, it's a sacrament. Uh, the most important sacrament to Catholics uh, or to Christians, and it's called the act of doing that transformation is called transubstantiation. So this is where our projects come together, I guess. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I was told by uh, uh, the, also it's so systematic there. So even among evangelicals, the same woman, her office was next to me, her bedroom was next to me. So I felt like she was also watching me all the time. And she told me one day, Suki, I don't think that you should drink that wine, you know, during service if you don't believe that's Jesus' blood. And what was really hard about that was my heart sank when she said that, but I also thought I was so angry because then we began discussing and she said that, you know, she really believed this world is not real and intimated our students those North Korean suffering was not real. And that was probably the only time I lost my cool. You know, and it's, you cannot lose your cool. Like, imagine me living there under this sort of a, you know, pretending to be Christian and pretending to be a school teacher, and I had to just be really, never ever express, expose my emotion. And I was so angry and scared. I still remember that feeling. I was so scared, like she caught on to what I was up to. But more than that, I was so angry, like I was shaking with anger. And I did say to her, you think the North Korean suffering is not real because this is not a real world. And I said, why don't you go check out the gulag and you dare to tell me this is not real. But the minute I said it, I thought, oh my God, Suki, what did you just do? <laughs> you know, because you're, you're not supposed to like break your, you know, you're, you have to be under, I mean, it was exhausting because you cannot So it, it was the pressure it. really that you were under that made you I think people think break. somehow when we see things like a gulag, we think, you know, it's a suffering over there. You know, we always separate ourselves from that story. We think, okay, that's difficult over there, and I'm sure it's hard. I'm sure they go hungry. But, you know, to be honest, what I experienced, uh, the feeling I remember the more clear, most clear is the utter exhaustion. It's so 
exhausting to be controlled all the time and have to watch yourself. Like, it was always having to rethink, like, did I say the wrong thing? Did I mess that up? Is somebody watching me? And then it's like going through it over and over and over again. It's playing a replay in your brain. And it's just, it's just exhausting. Like, that sense of exhaustion is like nothing else. And I think, I think fear is tiring. Being scared, perpetually scared, is the most tiring feeling. I just, I just want to briefly talk to you both about um, the, the impact of your stories um, before we open up to audience questions. Um, Mike, the, the, the Globe story had an immense impact all around the world, didn't it? And, and it's still happening now. I mean, there are still Catholic countries that are, that are where people are coming forward with stories of uh, abuse by priests. Yeah, the impact uh, was truly global. Um, and it is, uh, as you say, uh, still happening today. The aftershocks of uh, the Globe series uh, 16 years ago now are still being felt uh, all, over, all over the planet. Uh, most recently, there have been revelations of clergy sex abuse in Argentina, France, and uh, especially in Australia. And in Australia, uh, an investigation by a government commission, commonly known as the Royal Commission, has led to criminal charges against the third highest official uh, in the Vatican, Cardinal George Pell. And he has left the Vatican to return to Australia to face those charges. Uh, so the, the, uh, the impact has been extraordinary. You know, in Boston, uh, there have been a lot of, uh, in other dioceses, uh, there have been measures to protect children from, from sexual predators that have put into place. In the United States, uh, four months after we published our stories, all the American bishops got together and they produced a document called the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People. And there are many uh, worthwhile provisions in this document. Uh, for instance, uh, one uh, requires all bishops to report uh, evidence or suspicion of child sexual abuse to the police. Another one prohibits bishops from settling allegations of uh, clergy sexual abuse with confidentiality agreements, which was part of the wall of secrecy that we were discussing earlier. Uh, I think the most, uh, the, the, most, the, the most profound consequence and the one that's the most rewarding to me uh, is the stories have really liberated uh, tens of thousands of clergy sexual abuse victims all over the world from the, the, change, the, the, the chains of secrecy uh, and silence. You know, many, most victims around the world, they were uh, really ashamed. Uh, they were embarrassed. Uh, they felt that they were alone. Many felt that they were somehow responsible for what had happened to them. Uh, but once we revealed that this was a systemic uh, problem uh, and there were many, many, many victims, uh, people began to realize that they were not alone and they became emboldened uh, to say that what happened to them uh, was wrong uh, and to say it publicly and in many cases to seek uh, financial compensation for the injustices and the suffering uh, that they had endured. So for me, that's the most rewarding uh, piece of it is just the sense of... Uh, really uh, psychological and emotional liberation uh, for an incredible number of people all over the world. And um, Suki, just quickly, give, give us the, uh, your take on the kind of aftermath of, of what your story, once it was published. Well, after my book came out, I went on a, I felt like it was a part two of my struggle began, which was that the book was uh, uh, mispackaged as a memoir, not investigative journalism. And that decision that was made by a publisher, which I really fought, um, then had all these repercussions. So I want, of course, you know, New York Times did a story immediately in their news section focusing on my deception. Um, instead of looking at it as undercover journalism, and this, this went on the attack on deception, my deception, and also paranoia, because uh, they said that, you know, I've all, many reviews focused on this, that I was paranoid because I was lying. I was lying to the host uh, organization that brought me in. I was lying to the country that invited me in was the angle they took, lots of reviews and critics took. And from that, of course, then I was sort of misunderstood as like someone who just got a job teaching and then came home and wrote a book, which then you know completely discredited uh, a tenure of really careful, uh, you know, research into how to do this. And 
because it's very different if you have a book contract and you jump in there versus you went there by accident and you came home and wrote it up. So by calling it a memoir, then it takes away the expertise of your field. So I did write up an essay. Also, what that also means is by ca being categorized as a memoir, which is based on feelings rather than your reporting and investigation, it makes you not an expert, also disqualifies the book from many, many nonfiction journalism awards. Because those awards have, have become like a, you know, it's a stamp on how important the book is. It's serious, the book is, the seriousness is, of what I was telling, which is basically the psychology of the leadership, age 20, during the final year of Kim Jong-il, the great leader's life. That's when I lived there. And these were the creme de la creme, every university being shut in entire North Korea, except for these young men who are allowed to be in a university, which shows you that they are the future leadership. And me living there and getting into their psychology, like this is a in invaluable information that shows you in North Korea's most important year in their contemporary history that I was there documenting all of that. So I think to not focus that on that um, important, actually investigative finding, but instead discrediting me was so infuriating and debilitating that I did end up writing an essay called A Reluctant Memoirist in the New Republic, which went viral. So I fought and fought and fought about that. And finally, the publisher who refused to take the word memoir off the cover, when my essay went viral that week, I got an email and they said, okay, we are getting rid of that. Um, and also, it, it was original title the publisher insisted was, without you there is no us, my time with the sons of North Korea's elite. And I always said, I don't want my time with the sons. You know, it looks a little dodgy, like a woman's time with the sons. And like know my time business, and they wouldn't they wouldn't let me go my way. So my original title was Undercover Among the Sons of North Korea's Elite, and I did get that title with my essay when it went viral. But you know I had to do it through writing. It wasn't like me kicking and screaming. It was actually me writing an essay about it. Well, I think we can all agree they're two uh, very courageous journalists telling two very important stories. Um, we've just got about eight minutes left. I wonder if we could take some questions from the audience. Um, there's a, a lady in the front here with her hand up. Hi, my question's to both the panelists. Um, and this really goes to your last point, Suki. Um, I'm a former journalist, and if we really are to be truth tellers and truth seekers, when is it, what does it do to our credibility when you have to lie to expose the truth? Were there points you ever felt toxic? And is it all right to lie in the name of the greater good? Well, I'll, I'll take that on because uh, this is a question we've had to ask ourselves at the, the Spotlight team, and I think. Uh, you know, there, I think there's a general ethical rule here, but like all rules, there are exceptions. Uh, I think, generally speaking, uh, it's, it, it, it's unethical to, to pose as someone you are not in order to get a story. Uh, and at the Globe, we have a specific written rule that prohibits us uh, from going undercover. Uh, but there are times when uh, it's the only way to get a story. Uh, absolutely the only way. And I think when it is the only way, and those instances are extremely rare, uh, when it is the only way, uh, then I think it's the moral and ethical decision is to do that, especially in the case uh, of a regime like the one uh, in North Korea. Next question. Um, yes, young man here. After your work in North Korea, do you think, uh, they would have obviously become more cautious, so do you think your work has threatened the future of investigative journalism in North Korea? You're asking, has Suki's work threatened the investigative You're, journalism, uh, in, investigative North journalism in North Korea? Um, have I threatened the future works that could be done? I mean, there just wasn't, there's not been any uh, investigative work that was done in North Korea before. Because if you go in there and you basically take down what the regime allows and you come out, I mean, that there's nothing investigative about that. So, um, I mean, it's probably hard for someone to go undercover after me, but that's not a reason to not do it because how else are you going to get information out of there? The regime doesn't allow it. It's the world's most brutal regime 
that's been in existence for 70 plus years. So uh, there is no other way. And you know, you just have to find, people just have to keep finding a newer way of infiltrating the system. There's no other way of getting information out. Uh, gentleman in the blue t-shirt. This question is to Suki. So after spending a year in the oppressive regime of North Korea, uh, when you came home, did you have to relearn how to be free? Well, therapy helps. <laughs> um, it was, you know, it was, I was very traumatized. And I think it's actually, um, you know, it's actually recently I thought about that. How when I left Pyongyang, Kim, Kim Jong-il had just died. So it was this really odd moment how the world, like it, when I, like literally, when I found out he died, I really thought, oh my God, there's God, right? <laughs> For real. Um, because this is my final chapter. <laughs> what a miracle that Kim Jong-il died, like just as I was about to leave. But because it was so frightening to actually have this moment in history there, the borders were shutting down. Um, and because the great leader just died. And I was actually terrified that my plane will be stopped. So when the, my plane was taking off, I was like, thank God. You know, I was like, finally, I'm out of here. And then the plane actually turned around and came back a few hours later. Like, I looked outside. It was not Beijing. And we're landing. And it's only been about 35 minutes or so. And I really had that moment on that plane. Like, you know those movies where you pull that one person out? You think you're, you're, you're now going into safety, but actually, no. And it was like... Oh, they turned around because they know I'm on the plane, was what was going through my mind. There was some break in the machine on the plane. That's why that happened, supposedly. But when I came home after that, and when I arrived on the other side in Beijing and Seoul and New York, airports, the plane that came out of Pyongyang, journalists were just, just covered because they were trying to interview anyone who was coming out of Pyongyang. And I realized this story that I was carrying was, you know, I knew that, that this priceless story, and I had to just, I didn't, also I think that the world outside was so bright, plenty, and like people were laughing. I mean, it was just seemed like I just came out of some bizarre land where everything was horrible and gray. It was so depressing and horrible, and I just couldn't leave the house for months. And no one understood what I went through. So it was only my writing, but no one knew. Yes, there's a, uh, a lady there standing up in a denim jacket. I think Hi. this will have to be the last one, by the way. Um, as you said that uh, it must be traumatizing for you, and the process of both of your investigations were so intense, and it must be harrowing for you. What was it like emotionally, and how did you go through it? Uh, the question is to both the panelists. So it, it, it was hard. I, I think uh, those of us who are journalists, we like to think we have very thick skin and uh, that we're very uh, tough and that nothing uh, can affect us emotionally uh, as we go through the important exercise of investigative journalism. Uh, in, in the case of the Spotlight team, all of us were hearing uh, stories of uh, emotional, personal devastation uh, over and over again. Uh, and many of the survivors or the victims that really latched on to us. Uh, we were the first person they had ever talked to about this. And they became, uh, they, they, they imagined us as very, very close friends and intimate friends. And after a year of this, uh, it really did, um, it really became uh, an emotional burden to hear virtually nothing but these terrible, sad stories uh, over and over and over again. And I do remember finally, uh, after about a year and a half in March, of, of uh, 2003, we finally decided that we had, had exhausted the patience of our uh, readers uh, and also ourselves, and it was time to do another project. And the next project was an investigation of financial corruption and charitable foundations. And it meant reading a lot of uh, tax forms. And it's not normally the story, uh, the kind of story that I would want to do, which is not my thing. But in this case, I remember feeling uh, just so profoundly grateful uh, that all I had to do was sit in the office with a green shade on and look at tax returns and not hear any more sad stories again for a while. Okay, one more. Time for one more. Yes, uh, the lady here. Hi. Um, 
Very quickly, two parts. Uh, one, when the cat came out of the bag and when your work was discovered, the true nature of your work was discovered, did you receive any kind of hate or abuse from the evangelical group? And second, last year, Kim Jong-un's uh, older brother was executed. Did you ever think that they might up the game and try to kill a journalist to send out a message and prevent them from entering North Korea to do investigative journalism? Thank you. Just sorry, just repeat the second part of the question. Did, did she think she would be executed she, by North yeah, Korean agents? Just, to, just, just so the regime could send out a message to any uh, other investigative journalist, journalist thinking about uh, going into North Korea and doing well, this work. I, I Thank mean, you. Journalists going into North Korea uh, without the government sanction, I, it's just not being done. Um, I wish more, I don't know if I wish more were, but because it is a very dangerous thing, but I don't know how else we cover North Korea. But um, yeah, there were, there were threats when, once they knew the book was coming, and those threats just came constantly uh, through the school, who then uh, sent out all this harassment of, you know, they will take it to the next level, yeah, basically just daily threat. Um, they wanted the book stopped, publication stopped. They wanted the copy of the book so that they can approve it. Even after the book came out, I was just getting daily uh, these this things. But you know, that just comes with the territory. I mean, it was really unpleasant, but I knew that it would upset them. Um, I think that, I know that uh, North Korean government, uh, it's not, I've been advised that it's not a good idea to be in like a border area for me, really. So I avoid that kind of stuff in general. And when the horrible things happen, like when Kim Jong-nam was assassinated, when we saw Otto Warmbier coming out of there as a corpse, I think it's a reminder of how you just don't mess with North Korea in a way, right? So I think I have those moments of panic, but then those moments pass. I mean, I think that fear, people say, you know, like, oh, wow, you're, you must not have fear. I mean, it's not true. I mean, I think that you are afraid all the time. It's just when you're working, you let your, it's compartmentalizing. You don't focus on that fear because the work is so important. It's unacceptable the world doesn't know what's going on in there, but then you can go back to like being scared. So I think that's how I operate. Great. Well, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and please give a big hand to Suki and Mike. <laughs>Thank you so much again to our incredibly inspiring speakers for that conversation. Um, if you would like to ask them some more questions or get some books signed, please don't find them up front here. Please find them at the author signing tent at the back. Um, in 10 minutes, we have a session coming.